Our scripture passage this morning is Psalm 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Many of the psalms that we sing here at Redeemer... Uh, or many of the psalms in scripture are given to us with little to no context of when or by whom they were written. Um, At first glance, Psalm 96 appears to be one of these. There's no heading stating who the author was or under what circumstance it was composed. But actually, we know quite a bit about the context of this psalm. Hold your spot there in Psalms, but flip over to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. That's just a few books back from the book of Psalms. Uh, go backwards a few books, you'll find First Chronicles. Uh, when you find First Chronicles, open it up to chapter 16, and we'll start in verse 23. <clears throat> verse 23 of First Chronicles 16 says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. Do those words sound familiar? They should, because we just read them in Psalm 96. And this song of 1 Chronicles continually, continues virtually verbatim of Psalm 96 all the way until verse 33, Where it says, Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Which is how Psalm 96 ends. So we see there the same song. Remember that the book of Psalms is a collection of the songs of Israel. One of the songs that they collected and added to their songbook was this song recorded for us in 1 Chronicles 16. And that is helpful Because in 1 Chronicles, we have some context about this song. First, we learn that this was a song that David wrote, or at least oversaw the writing and singing of it. So this is a psalm of David. And then in verse 1 of 1 Chronicles, uh, it tells us why David wrote the song. Verse 1 of chapter 16 says, And they brought in the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. So Psalm 96 was written because the Ark of the Covenant was being brought back to Jerusalem. This is the same Ark in which Moses put the Ten Commandments. This is the Ark on which God's presence rested in the wilderness, in a cloud and a pillar of fire. This is the same Ark that led Israel into the Promised Land, parting waters and enemies before it. But after they entered the promised land, this is the same ark that was captured by the Philistines, causing all Israel to cry out and shudder in terror, Ichabod, 
the glory of God has departed from Israel. But God did not depart from Israel for long, for as soon as the Philistines took the ark, God punished them with plagues and diseases until they sent the ark back to Israel. But however, the entire time during King Saul's reign, the ark was basically forgotten. It was kept in the spare bedroom of a priest in some podunk village until God raised up a king after his own heart. And so once David takes the throne, he sends for the ark to bring it home. Because David desires for all of Israel's faith to be in God and not in him. He wants to lead Israel in worshiping God. So he tries to bring the ark back to Jerusalem, the capital city that all Israel may come there and worship God. But you'll remember that David's first attempt of bringing the ark home was unsuccessful. He sends for it on a cart, and when the cart stumbles and Uzzah reaches out to touch it, Uzzah is struck dead for touching the ark of God. But the second time, here in 1 Chronicles 16, David brings the ark back home God's way, according to God's rules. He has the Levites carry the ark on a pole instead of a cart, as God had commanded him. And so finally, the ark comes back home to Jerusalem, where it belongs. You can understand why this would be an exciting day for Israel, and especially for King David. The treasured ark was being brought home again. But David understood the return of the ark to be more than just a celebration that a box was being put back in its proper place. It was more than just a relic being added to the Jerusalem Museum. David knew that the coming of the, 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 coming of the ark to the capital city was a physical representation and foreshadowing of God himself coming to rule over Israel as its king. This event was a pledge from God that he would rule his people from Mount Zion, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And so with the foretaste of this joyous promise in his heart, David sheds his royal robes, dances in the street among the commoners, and fills all Jerusalem with songs of praise for the triumphal entry of their true king. My friends, we have the privilege this morning of joining with David in singing a song of our king's inauguration. I hope this song warms your heart as it did David's. So turn back to Psalm 96 and let's look at our text in detail. Uh, this psalm that, that we're going to look at in just a moment does not divide up into sections uh, quite as neatly as some passages. And that's largely because this song is... Uh, there's such a joyous and unified theme throughout this entire psalm. Spurgeon commenting on Psalm 96 said, As for divisions, we make none, for this is a garment of praise without seam, woven from the top throughout. So instead of divisions or points this morning, I want to organize our thoughts around the way this song progresses. How this song expands. Like a lens zooming further and further out, to give you a wider and wider picture, uh, a view of the picture that you're looking at. The psalm begins with a call for God's people to praise God, their Savior. That's the smallest, most zoomed in picture. God's people. That's verses 1 through 6. Then in verse 7, that picture expands to a call for all families of all people to praise God, their Sovereign. It's zooming out from God's people to all people. That's verses 7 through 10. And then in verse 11, that view expands even further to a call for all creation to praise God, its judge. That's the final panoramic view we see in verses 11 through 13. So let's think along that progression this morning. A call to praise beginning with God's elect and expanding all the way to creation itself. Read with me the first three verses of this psalm as we see how those whom God has saved are called to praise him. Psalm 96, beginning in verse 1. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. This psalm begins with a command to sing a new song to the Lord. 
That phrase, new song, isn't referring to the newness of the song itself. After all, when we sing this together at Redeemer, we're singing a song that was written 3,000 years ago. It's not much of a new song. What David means by new song is a song that praises God's new mercies. It is as if David was saying, yesterday we praised God for his mercy, but today we have received more and new mercies from the Lord. Therefore, the songs we sing yesterday are not enough. We must sing a new song. Let us offer up new thanks for the new mercy we have received. And of course, this new mercy to which he is referring is the return of the ark and the subsequent reign of Christ, which the, of which the ark was a seal. But the most glorious reason we have to praise God is for his salvation. Look at verse 2. It says, Tell of his salvation from day to day. All the earth should praise him as creator. Every person in whom there is the breath of life should praise him as life giver. Everyone who eats should praise him as provider. But we, his children, surpass them all in praise. For we praise him as our savior. The first six verses give instructions for those who have been saved. There is the call in verse 1 for all the earth to sing to the Lord. But apart from that, the focus of these first verses are on the praise of those who can tell of his salvation. Those who understand the vanity of idol worship and the splendor and the majesty of the Lord. These first six verses are a command directed toward God's people. God's people are to do two things we see in the first six verses. Praise and proclaim their Savior. We see this easily when we look at the verbs of these first six verses, or the first three verses. Just looking at the verbs, they are sing, 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 bless, declare, tell. Six short commands that are the proper response for those whom God has saved. This salvation that we have received should produce praise. This is the first four commands. Sing, 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 bless. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. We respond to God's mercy by praising him for it. Now, it's no coincidence that the command to sing is given three times in a row. Singing is an important theme throughout the whole Bible. In fact, it's one of the most common direct commands given in the Bible, as we see in our text today. The book of Psalms itself is the largest book of the whole Bible, and it is made up entirely of songs for God's people to sing. John tells us that we will spend eternity singing praises to God in heaven. So if singing is such a predominant theme throughout Scripture, and if we are commanded three times in these verses to sing to the Lord, then we should be serious about obeying this command. God commands us to sing his praises. And not just in the Old Testament, Colossians 3.16 tells us sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Not just praise God in our thoughts, not just recognize him in our conversations by saying praise God when we hear some good news, not even by just offering up prayers of praise and thanksgiving to God. All these are good in our ways that we can praise God, but none of those things fulfill the thrice-given command to sing, sing, sing to the Lord. This is primarily a corporate command, not a private one. Listening and singing and meditating on theologically rich songs throughout your week is a great way to spend your time. But the intention of this command is for it to be fulfilled corporately by the body of Christ singing praises together. David wasn't calling all of Israel to sing songs in private. He was calling them to fill the streets and lift up their voices in song with the rest of Israel. So let me encourage you, brothers and sisters, when we have the opportunity to sing praises to God together as a church, sing with purpose. For in singing, you are obeying the command of God. Should the ark of the Lord which was but a shadow, bring about more rejoicing and singing than the coming of God in the flesh? No, one topic that continually comes up at staff and elder meetings is how we can best facilitate 
congregational singing on Sunday morning. The elders, the music team, David Eibach and the other guys running the sound in the back, they're all constantly trying to do everything they can to encourage our singing together as a congregation. From the song selection to the instruments to the volume of the microphones, all are intentionally chosen to help the congregation sing well. But all the encouragement in the world amounts to nothing if we as a church do not have a desire to sing the praises of God. Can you imagine how frustrated David would have been if he had been singing and dancing and rejoicing at the return of the ark, but everyone else refused to join him? My friends, may we seek to honor God and encourage each other in the way we sing God's praises. So to that end, let me give you a few helpful encouragements uh, to help you think about the way we sing on Sunday mornings. First, I encourage you to join the throng. Singing is not about you. So don't close your eyes and imagine that you're the only one in the room. You are but one voice among the many. But the many voices combine to offer up one song of praise to our Lord. So look around as you're singing. Listen, even as you sing. For even as God has made us one body, when we sing, we praise him with one voice. Congregational singing is a great example of the unity we share in Christ Jesus. Number two, sing convictionally. The songs we sing here at Redeemer go far beyond my ability to write. I'm not creative enough to string together phrases like, let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. I may not be able to write such words myself, but I can certainly affirm it as I sing it. So sing as one who is declaring great truths about a great God. Thirdly, sing confidently. You sing so much better when you are confident of the words and the tunes to the songs that you're singing. So strive to learn the songs that we sing here at Redeemer so that you can sing them well on Sunday with us. If you don't know a song when we sing it, look it up on YouTube and learn it throughout the next several weeks so that the next time you can sing it well. Sing these songs that we sing at home so that your kids can learn them and can participate with us when we sing. Redeemer has a very helpful Spotify playlist uh, that has most of the songs we sing on it. I recommend that to you. But take the time to learn the songs so that you can sing them confidently on Sunday. And particularly, let me encourage fathers specifically to take the initiative in leading your family by example in prioritizing and participating in the singing of, for God's glory. Fourth, sing unto the Lord, not to man. One reason people sing quietly at church is because they do not want people to hear them sing. If this is you, I assure you that you think your voice sounds worse than it actually does. No one notices your voice as much as you do. But even if, like me, God has not blessed you with a particularly beautiful voice, Sing so as to please God with your voice and not men. Do you think in Revelation the four living creatures and the angels singing praises to the Lamb were worried about what John thought of their singing ability? God has given you your voice and would have you use it to sing his praises to the best of your ability. So do not be embarrassed to sing the praises of your God. And going along with that one, number five, I encourage you to sing loudly. Singing is not a private activity. Singing is meant to be heard. So do not content yourself with singing as quietly as you can, as if you are ashamed for anyone to hear you singing the praises of God. Instead, sing loudly. Sing proudly. What a shame it would have been if the four living creatures around the throat were not singing praises loud enough for John to hear them. God deserves to have his praises heard. So sing loudly. And number six, sing lovingly. How loudly should you sing? Sing as loudly as you can sing lovingly. Do not seek to drown out the other voices around you when you sing. Instead, seek to compliment them with your own. Sing like you would want your neighbor next to you to sing. Loud enough to be heard, but not so loud that it's the only voice that can be heard. And then number seven, Sing as well as you are able. This is the summary of all my advice. If you forget all the rest, 
try to fulfill this one. Sing as well as you are able. Sing every song we sing as beautifully and as intentionally as you can. Sing to the glory of God, for he deserves nothing less. Let's strive to implement some of these uh, practices when we sing this psalm at the close of our service today. But before that, let's get back to our text. We saw the first way we should respond to God's salvation is by singing his praises. Sing, 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 bless. But notice those next two commands in verses 2 and 3. Tell, declare. Tell of his salvation, declare his glory. God's salvation should first cause us to respond in praise to him, but the second natural reaction is to tell others about it. Salvation leads to both praise and proclamation. We do this all the time uh, in our daily lives. How often have you told someone, you need to go see that movie? Or, hey, did you know kids eat free at so-and-so's on Tuesday nights? Or, come look at this new gadget that I bought. When we have experienced something that benefited us or that we're proud of, we tell others about it. Because we want them to enjoy it just like we do. Salvation should be no different. If God has saved us, then the only natural response is to tell others who God is and what God has done, so that they too might share in the blessings that we enjoy. So as verse 2 says, we tell of his salvation from day to day. We declare his glory among the nations and his marvelous works among the people. We do it for their benefit, that they might enjoy the grace of God as we do. But we have another motivation for sharing the gospel as well. Look at verses 4 through 6. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. We proclaim the gospel of God because God deserves to be proclaimed. To be praised by everyone. Our God is great, therefore he deserves great praise from a great number of people. We should have a burning desire to share the gospel with everyone because we have a burning desire to see God glorified. We know that God is sovereign and that whenever someone is saved, it is because he has chosen to save them and has been gracious to them. But that doesn't change the fact that it thrills our hearts to see that work happen. Our greatest desire as Christians should be to see sinners repent and believe in the gospel, not merely because that person is now saved from hell, but because now there is one more person to join us in offering praise to God. God is now getting the praise he deserves from that person. And God's glory and might is shown to all the world uh, through the miraculous salvation of yet another sinner from the jaws of sin and death. As verse 6 says, Splendor and majesty are before him, and strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. When someone is converted, all of those attributes of God are on display. And that person now recognizes God's splendor and majesty and strength and beauty. And will join us in praising God's perfections. But because Christians desire to see God praised by every creature, it should enrage us when we see that praise, which rightly belongs to God, being offered to something else unworthy of it. This is why in verse 4 and 5, David contrasts God with idols. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Nothing lights a fire in our bones like some, watching someone wrong another. How many of you able-bodied men would be able to sit, but sit back and watch as someone stole a woman's purse without trying to stop them? Or could any of you bring yourself to stay silent if you knew someone was intentionally taking advantage of some elderly person, defrauding them and stealing their money without their knowledge? Or take a a bully taking a smaller kid's milk money. Whatever the case may be, we can't just sit back and watch as some injustice is taking place before our eyes. Just thinking about it makes our blood boil. This is what David feels when he sees the nations worshiping their idols. He sees all these people defrauding God out of what is rightfully his. 
and giving it to those that don't deserve it. These idols are stealing the worship that is rightfully due to God. God is to be feared above all people, but these people fear their idols. God deserves to be worshipped, but these people are worshipping idols. God deserves all worship. These idols deserve no worship. God doesn't get what he does deserve, and these idols get what they don't deserve. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. God is worthy, but these idols are worthless. That word worthless idols literally means nothing. The gods of the people are a nothing, a no thing, a non-entity. These nothings are being worshipped while the God who made the heavens is not. This is the fire behind David's charge to tell of God's salvation. This is why he must declare his glory among the nations. Because worthless nothing idols are receiving that which only God deserves. Idols don't have to be made of wood or gold. They are anything that becomes more important to a person than God. May we learn to see the idolatry that surrounds us, like politics or self-advancement or pleasure or greed, and may those idols provoke our zeal for God's glory and cause us to tell of his salvation from day to day. There is no greater motivation for sharing the gospel than a desire to see God glorified through the salvation of sinners. And this starts in our own hearts and daily ridding ourselves from all the glory-stealing idols we find in our lives. So thus far in our text, the psalmist was mainly addressing God's children. But in verse 7, the focus widens. Now David appeals to families of the peoples. That is, all the families of all the peoples. Now all the people of the earth have a commission. And it mirrors that commission given to God's people. We saw the commands to praise and pro proclaim in verses 1 through 3 by following the six imperative verbs, sing, 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 bless, tell, declare. Starting in verse 7, we have seven new commands, the first three of which are again repeated. Ascribe, 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 come, or bring, come, worship, tremble. Let's read verses 7 through 9. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The command ascribe has to do with giving God what he deserves. Ascribe to him glory because he is glorious. Ascribe to him strength, because he is strong. If the first command of sing, sing, sing to the Lord teaches us the correct response to God, this command, ascribe, ascribe, ascribe to the Lord, teaches us that God deserves such a response. We ascribe to God that which he is. We acknowledge his perfection. We give him what he deserves. In verse 8, we see this phrase, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. When you think of God's glory, think of his holiness and beauty on display. We are commanded to ascribe to him the glory that he deserves for revealing himself to us as glorious. Just as we ascribe beauty to a beautiful picture in response to seeing it, so we ascribe glory to, God, to a glorious God in response to experiencing him. This is really the central theme of the entire psalm. Give God his due. Christians, give God what he is due. Namely, praise and proclamation. All people of the earth, give God what he is due. Namely, your worship. All creation, give God what he is due. Namely, your rejoicing and delight. Ascribe to the Lord that glory which is due his name. Think for a moment about how much glory God is due. He is creator, sustainer, ruler, savior, and judge. He deserves an infinite amount of praise for any one of those roles. Yet how great of a debt has mankind accumulated for not ascribing to the Lord the glory due his name? No man is able to give God all the glory he deserves, 
And most men never ascribe any glory to him at all. Even we, his children, must confess that our desires to glorify God are small and inconsistent. But though we are too small and too sinful to give God all the glory he deserves, let us not fail to do so for a lack of effort. May this be our mission and purpose in life, to endeavor to ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. The Westminster Catechism tells us that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Let us not lower our goal. The chief end of man is not a better knowledge of God. The most important thing you can accomplish is not to repent of some particular sin. The greatest desire, your greatest desire, should not be to be consistent in your reading your Bible every day. All those are wonderful things, but they are lousy goals. They are means, they are not ends. They are steps that lead to our goal, but they are not the goal itself. Our goal should be to bring glory to God. And then if that is our goal, the next question is how do we do that? How can we bring glory to God? Well, the answer is by doing all those things that we said before. By repenting of sin, by reading and praying consistently, by learning who God is and obeying his commands in scripture. But we should do all those things because we have an unquenchable, unquenchable desire to glorify God. Our chief goal should be to ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Anything less is an unworthy response to the God who created and saved us. What a strong defense this mindset will prove against sin and Satan. In the hour of temptation, ask yourself, is this a fitting response to the kind and perfect God who saved me? Is this giving God the glory he is due from me? Can I sin against the one who rightly deserves all my love, praise, and devotion? May the glory do God keep us from sinning against him. But then look at the next four commands, starting in the second half of verse 8. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Bring, come, worship, tremble. Notice here that the worship is described not by what God gives to men, but by what men do before God. Bring, come, worship, tremble. Those are all verbs that focus on what we do in response to God, and not what God does for us. Worshiping God is about worshiping God. It is not primarily about what we get from worshiping God. Now to be sure, it is not as if God needed our worship, or as if our praises added anything to his perfection. Our worship doesn't make God great any more than looking at a beautiful picture makes it beautiful. Instead, our worship is a response to God's perfection. It is because the Lord is great that he is greatly to be praised. The primary reason we should worship God is because God is worthy of our worship. The benefits and joys that God gives us when we worship him are secondary. This is what I mean. When we gather together to worship God on Sunday, the primary reason is so that we can praise and worship God for who he is. The secondary reason we gather is because it is encouraging to our souls and renewing for our minds to sing his praises and hear his word preached. But why do we sing? It is not because it gives us a warm, fuzzy, emotional high. We sing because God deserves to be sung about. Why do we proclaim the gospel? Because God deserves to be talked about. Why do we repent of sins? Because God deserves to be lived for and obeyed. Why do we read our Bible and listen to the preaching of the word? Because God deserves to be known by us. And why do we pray? Because God deserves for us to express our love for him and our desires to him. Are there secondary benefits to all of these things which are for our good? Of course. I hope none of you are so stoic that you can, that you can find no joy or comfort in singing the songs of God. But the main motivation behind all that we do should not be what we gain from worshiping God, but rather how much God deserves our worship. 
We worship him because of who he is. And God is due such worship from all the families of the people of the earth. But notice what particular aspect the psalmist highlights when he declares that every person is duty bound to render unto God worship and praise. Why should all the people of the world worship him? Because God is sovereign. Look at verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. God deserves worship from every person of every nation because he sits over them as their ruling king. The word sovereignty has to do with reigning, with kingship. If someone is your, your sovereign, they are your king. They have authority over you. They are reigning over you. The Lord reigns over all the world. He established the earth. Not only did God create the earth, but he established it. You can think of a building being so well established in the ground that it won't fall over. Regardless of what assails the earth or tries to tear it down, the earth and all that happens on it will never be manipulated by anything or anyone but God. God is sovereign. He sustains the earth and he rules over it as king. He makes the rules. He decides what happens and what doesn't happen. He calls the shots. Therefore, let all the world know they have a responsibility to praise the Lord because whether they like it or not, the Lord reigns over them. He is their king and he will be their judge. And that idea of God as judge brings us right into the last section of this psalm. In verse 11, the, the lens once again zooms out. Just when we think that it, we've seen the whole picture, that it can't get any wider than every man in every nation being called on to praise God, it does. Now the psalmist calls not only every created man to praise God, but every created thing to give God praise. For he is the judge of all creation. Look at verse 11. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Heavens, earth, sea, field, trees. Even these inanimate objects should feel joy in knowing that the Lord is coming to judge the earth. Paul tells us that creation itself is groaning under the curse of sin that was brought into the world through Adam. Romans 8, 20-22 20, uh, 20 says, For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Creation groans because of sin. When God cursed Adam, he also cursed the ground. The earth was corrupted. The seas are now violent. The skies bring either scorching heat or icy, bitter cold. The fields are no longer able to willingly yield their fruit to men, but rather must produce thorns and thistles. Trees are hewn down and fashioned into a cross on which the one whom they desire to glorify is crucified. But all the while, creation is groaning and longing for that day when it will no longer be subjected to futility, but will serve and glorify God the way it was created to. When it too will finally give God the glory due his name. So at the news of Christ's coming, all creation rejoices. For when he comes, he will judge all sin. And in his justice, he will save the sons of glory and redeem creation itself. So that in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be neither scorching sun nor icy wind. And the ground will not produce thorns and thistles and trees of death, but the tree of life, yielding its 12 kinds of fruit each month with leaves for the healing of the nations. And the earth itself will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. 
Creation longs for a judge. Think of the judges in the Bible, like Gideon, Jephthah, Deborah, and Samson. They were mighty men and women who rescued Israel from the persecution of their enemies. Behold, Christ comes to judge the earth, to deliver the earth, to punish those who have filled it with sin, and to rescue those who are forgiven in Christ. May the news of our coming judge, our deliverer, fill us with joy, as it does creation itself. As it did David, who at the coming of his God, filled the streets with dancing and the singing of this new song of the foreshadowed and promised mercy in Christ Jesus. In summary, Psalm 96 is a psalm of the Lord's worth. The Lord is worthy. God is worthy to be praised by his people, by all people, and by all things. This is the glory due his name. He is worthy to be praised as creator, sovereign king, and judge. But most of all, he is worthy to be praised for his salvation. So let us close by reading another new song of our Lord's worth. One which, we, one which will be sung for all eternity. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 5, starting in verse 8. Note especially how this too is a song of the worthiness of Jesus Christ and the expanding praise, beginning with just a few and expanding until every creature is praising his name. Let's all stand together as we read this. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5 will begin in verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. I heard in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down in worship. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, you are worthy of all blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. You are worthy of our worship. Our prayer is this. Glorify yourself in us. Grant us to ascribe unto you the glory due your name. And through the blood of Christ, forgive us when we fail to do so. Amen.